Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you all to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Los Alamos. A special welcome to our guests this morning and for those who are worshiping with us online. Thank you for welcoming us into your home or wherever you're gathered for worship this morning. I'm Reverend John Nash. I'm joined in worship leadership by, this morning by Kathy, who is our lay reader. Valerie is leading us in hymns. Yelena is on piano. In the sound booth, we have Don, Julie, Sam, and James, and Anne and Kim, our usher. So thank you to them for their worship leadership this morning. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said, Whoever you are and whatever faith you were born, whatever creed you confess, if you've come here to find God, to encounter God, you are welcome here. And we are indeed glad that you are with us this morning. We continue in our worship series on the knots of Jesus. That is the things Jesus told us not to do. And so we hope that you have come with the expectation that we will encounter the risen Christ. Kathy, you're going to be over here. Thank you. We hope that you have come with the expectation that we, you will encounter the risen Christ. The Holy Spirit will be moving and working amongst us here this morning that will tr be transformed by gathering together as the people of Christ. So I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Remain seated if that is more comfortable as Kathy leads us in our call to worship and opening prayer. How majestic is the name of the Lord. The glory of God shines from the heavens. Who are we that God is mindful of us? Yet God has crowned us with glory and honor. How majestic is the name of the Lord. The glory of God shines from the heavens. Together, let us pray. God of all creation, the moon, sun, and stars display the work of your design, shining out your glory to all the world and making known the majesty of your name. We too have the power of creation to be known by our goodness and love. And we also have the power of destruction to be known by our hate and damage. Help us to become beacons of love, lights of forgiveness, and signs of your grace by being imitators of Christ so that we put away all anger and malice and instead love one another as you have first loved us. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing of God's majestic name shown forth around the world.
Let us confess our faith before God and one another. We believe in God the Creator, who created and is creating everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us unique, individual, and beloved of God. We believe in God the Christ, who saved and is saving everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us unique, individual, and beloved of the Christ. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who guided and is guiding everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us unique, individual, and beloved of the Spirit. We believe that this one God in three persons is present among us, working directly in our lives and the lives of all who are born into this world, striving to bring us back into harmony with all creation and with God, forgiving, healing, touching everyone, never rejecting any who willingly receive this freely offered gift of love and grace and eternal life. Amen. Together, let us pray our prayer for illumination. God of eternal promises, fill us with the faith of the saints in hearing your word, that we might be enlivened to live in your ever-empowering grace. Amen. Our first reading comes from the letter to the Ephesians. The author has been emphasizing the unity that is found in Christ and urging the church to put away their old way of living and instead renew their minds in Christ in order to live in true righteousness. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Our gospel reading comes from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. After feeding the 5,000, the disciples then get into a boat to cross the sea. When they see Jesus walking on the water and the crowds also cross the sea, 
Jesus tells them that they are looking for signs because they ate the bread, but they should stop seeking the food that perishes, but instead to seek the bread that endures forever and gives life. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. If you have celebrations, concerns, or hopes to lift up to God this morning, you are invited to come forward and light a candle, and you may also fill out a prayer card to be lifted up in prayer later during worship. For those worshiping online, you are also invited to light a candle where you are, and to put your prayer requests in the comments section or submit them through the Church Center app while we go to the garden to once again hear God tell us that we are beloved children. <laughs>
And you may be seated. And if you've not already been using your scripture insert, I invite you to take that out and make use of write things, make use on the back of things to write to down to remember from today's service. So if you've been here for a while, I've mentioned this before. When I'm driving, I can be an angry and vocal driver, not like rolling down my window and yelling at other people, but yelling at them in my car. So a little while back, I was driving with Lizzie, who is our four-year-old, though now she'll tell you that she's almost this many. Uh, and I yelled out, come on, you idiot. And Lizzie said, what's wrong? And I said, well, the driver in front of me doesn't know what they're doing. And so she said, so that's why they're an idiot? Proud parental moment right there. Sarcasm, obviously. As every parent knows, our children are much more likely to do what we do than to do what we say to do. Especially if those two things don't correspond with one another. And what we say and how we act says much more than what we say we believe. And so with that, we have to think about the power of our words and how they not only affect the world, but also how they affect us. And so with that, we move on in our series on the knots of Jesus onto his claim that we are not to complain. And this was the one I was most worried about coming into, just so you know that, because Complaining is just something we do. Studies show that most of us, on average, complain between 15 and 30 times a day. And I'm sure that some of you say, well, that's not me. But as Reverend Bowen says, who we talked about when we talked about the uh, complaint-free world a couple of years ago, um, he said that, you know, complaining is sort of like bad breath. You notice it on others, not so much in yourself. Now, I think that while not complaining is generally a good idea, we should note that there are times in which complaints are appropriate and necessary, and we'll come back to that idea. There's a very specific context, though, in which Jesus makes this injunction not to complain, as we heard from the Gospel of John this morning. And Kathy said in the introduction, before this interchange, Jesus is up on a mountaintop, feeds 5,000 people, and then comes off, walks across the water, which is much more impressive than just parting waters. And then, to make it a little more impressive, the people themselves go around the water, meet Jesus on the other side, and they ask, Jesus, what sign are you going to give us? This section of the Gospel of John is known as the Book of Signs because there's a series of miracles that Jesus does throughout that John uses to say that this is who This proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he's fed the 5,000, and they say, what sign are you going to give? After all, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. So hopefully you're seeing the sort of comparisons here between the Exodus story and the story that's taking place here with, with Jesus. And Jesus says, you're looking for the wrong things. I am the bread of life. So this is one of the I am statements in John. And again, thinking of the Exodus story when Moses says, who should I say sends me? Jesus, I mean, God says, I am. So direct again connection here to the Exodus story. But this statement, I am the bread of life, begins the religious leaders to begin to complain, as we heard in the, the NRSV translation, New International Version says they're grumbling to each other. And so two important points about this. The first is that with the rise of anti-Semitism in the country, or perhaps maybe not the rise, but it's once again become fashionable to say the silent things out loud in public, we should have to deal with the Jews saying this, right? But what religion was Jesus? Jewish. What religion were all the apostles and disciples? Jewish. Right? So, while the Gospels and John in particular use a certain polemic against sort of classifying everybody 
as Jewish, we have to understand first that this is an intra-religious argument, right? Even at the latest dating of the Gospel of John, there has not been sort of an official separation yet between Christians and Jews, right? There's people who are following Judaism, and then there's people who are saying, no, the Messiah has already come, but largely they would still be sort of existing within a synagogue or within a, a, a Jewish context, right? Even the Gentiles who are converting into Christianity you still have that sort of tie that's coming in there. And so really John is sort of illustrating this argument that's taking place within an intra-religious dialogue. So let me rephrase this in a different way to make it clear that it's not to say that all Jews are doing this just to sort of off, because it would be the same thing as if we said, Christians began complaining. Now, if you said that or heard somebody say that, would you really think that meant all Christians? Because No, because we understand the diversity of opinion within Christianity, right? This is a huge diversity, diversity of, within Judaism at the time, as it still exists today, just as it does within the Christian church, right? Or we might say, the Methodists began complaining. And we would understand, well, it's not all Methodists, right? There's a portion who are doing this work. So a better understanding, as I said at the beginning, rather than saying all Jews is, say, religious leaders, but even that can be problematic because within the Gospel of John, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, both re Jewish religious leaders, are supporters of Jesus. So even saying religious leaders is sort of a broader category than what we can sort of apply here. So when you hear, in particular, John say, the Jews, take that with a grain of salt, understand the context in which he's doing that so we don't begin to make these wide beliefs about this group of people who were opposed to Jesus uh, when it was only a few. And the other piece is this connection, as I've already talked about, between what's happening here and the story of the Exodus. Because if you were reading this in the original Greek in John, and also happened to be reading the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and the Exodus, when the Israelites, see how easy it is to group an entire people, are out in the wilderness, right? They begin complaining to Moses. Well, it probably wasn't all of them. Again, a group of people who are doing this. But the complaining, the grumbling they do, the Greek word there in the Exodus story is, again, the exact same one that's used in this story. So the feeding out in the wilderness, right, crossing through water, matching up here against the Exodus story. And so then there's this definite connection between these complaints of complaining against God. And in these complaints, then, completely overlooking all the things that God has already done for them, right? It's like saying, sure, you, you fed us yesterday, but what have you done for us lately? <clears throat> right? So it's about this sense of, where are you, God? What are you doing for me right now? And then overlooking everything that's already come. And when we overlook the, the blessings we've already received, we're much more likely to overlook the blessings we're receiving right now, too. And then this is also that sense of, why should we trust these people who say they're coming from you, right? Why should we trust Moses? Why should we trust Jesus? Are they truly the people you have sent? Or is there something else going on, right? Do they have some power play they're trying to do? And then it's a question then about, are we going to really follow God? Because as I've said before, we all say we want to follow God, just as some of us would like to follow in an advisory capacity, not as a true disciple, right? When God says, go and do this, we say, well, maybe not. Are you sure you're talking to the right person? Are you sure you really want me to do that? And when we don't want to do that, then that grumbling starts to come in. And I'm sure that we have all known people who complain about just about everything, right? Everybody knows somebody like that, right? And in complaining, what do they miss? All the good things that are happening around them, all the blessings 
that they are received. And there's some people who will say, well, you know, complaining and grumbling is actually a good thing. It's good to get all those emotions out there, right? But if that was actually true, if it was a truly good thing, then the happiest and healthiest people we know would be the people who complain all the time. But does that match up? No. Because the people who complain all the time, guess what, tend to be the unhappiest people. Why? Because they're never seeing the positives in their life. All they see is the negative things that they're happening about because it gives them something to complain about. And so they miss the blessings. But just like with the other knots that we've looked at, not complaining is not an absolute rule. Because, again, there are reasons and times to complain. Scripture is full of complaints, right? We have the book of Lamentations. That's basically a book of complaints. Psalm 64 begins, O Lord, hear the voice of my complaints. But here's the truth about those complaints. They're being made to the person that can actually do something about it. God, right? Most of the time when we complain, Do we complain to the person who can actually change the situation? No. We complain to each other. We complain to our spouse, our friends, our partners, whatever it might be, but not to the people who actually have some control over it. And that perhaps might be what Jesus is calling out here because what are the, the leaders doing? They're complaining amongst themselves. They're not even going to Jesus to complain or say, you know, explain this statement that you are the bread of life. Tell us what's really going on there. Instead, they're complaining amongst themselves. They don't go to the person who can actually solve the problem, right? And so complaining does not, not complaining does not mean putting up with bad behavior or bad situations. If you go to a restaurant and your soup is cold, saying to the waiter, the server, my soup is cold, could you replace it, is not a complaint, Right? That's a statement of fact. Statement of facts are neutral. Right? But if you, that gives him or her an opportunity to solve the problem. But if all you do is complain to the people at your table and never say anything to anyone else, that's just complaining. Right? And we're not talking if it's gazpacho soup or something supposed to be cold. Right? We're supposed to talking about something that's really um, happening. And more worse is that often when we complain is that we then lambast the person that we're complaining to, right? How dare you serve me cold soup? Do you know who I am? Right? It becomes an ego thing. That's where most of our complaining is centered, is in that sense of self. Again, in the words of Reverend Will Bowen, he says, a complaint often has a sense of being a counterattack for a perceived injustice of saying, this is unfair, or how dare this happen to me? And therefore, we personalize what has happened, and we feel justified, therefore, in how we treat the other person, because they've somehow attacked us. We've made it personal, and so we feel it's okay to be personal in our response. And that's where we really begin to get ourselves in trouble. And that's where that passage from Ephesians then comes into play. And the passage from Ephesians is actually paired with that, the passage we heard from the Gospel of John for this morning uh, in the lectionary, which are the recommended scripture readings for each Sunday or each holiday of the year, used a lot by a large portion of the Protestant church and the Roman Catholic church. And I think that those two passages go together fairly nicely. Because we have this statement, Jesus saying, do not complain matched up with the author of Ephesians, who starts this passage. He's talking about, again, how we are to live after having accepted Christ. After we've entered into the waters of baptism and been reborn on the other side as a new creation in Christ, it says, stop living the ways of the world, stop living in darkness, start living in faith, start living in the light. And so he says that we are to live differently from the world by telling the truth to others because he says we are members of one another 
It means we are, in the words of Dr. King, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And so to be honest in our relationship, to be true in our relationships, we have to be true with one another. Now, unfortunately, in a modern context, we've used this sense of being truthful with one another with being jerks. And then trying to cover it up by the statement, I'm just keeping it real, just telling the truth, right? Telling the truth does not give us permission to demean or belittle another person. That's part of being members of the same body, of being united together. And it ties into then what follows. He says, first, be angry, which is not a commandment right? Because we know that because of what follows. Be angry, but do not sin. That is, recognize that anger is one of our emotions. You are going to have anger, but be careful what it leads us to. Now, if sin, as I refer to it, is a breaking of relationship, then that sense of be angry, but do not sin is important. Because being angry can lead us away from living in true relationship, lead us to breaking relationship by how we act of doing derogatory, destructive things through our words and through our actions. And that becomes even clearer then at the end of the passage in which we are told to put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And that's clearly, he says, about how we talk, because he says, Not no evil come from your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. I think that's the key to this sense of not complaining and what complaints do is may your words give grace to those who hear. That is, there are times in which we need to give voice to our complaints. Usually that should be to the person who can do something about it. But do our words build up or do they tear down? Do they express God's grace or do they express hate and animosity? That is, what we do and say to others matters. It's an expression of who we are. And so what we should say to others, what we should even say to ourselves, should build people up and should convey God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness. That we are called to imitate Christ. And to make a sacrifice of our lives. And when you make a sacrifice, that means you have to give something up, right? And so maybe that giving up is the sense of, I can say whatever I want to whoever I want. Sort of funny, however, when we talk about freedom of speech, it comes immediately after something that's just people have objected to, right? Well, I I have the freedom of speech. I can say that. Well, yeah, you can, but should you? We don't very much talk about Christian speech, but we should. Because we are to be representatives of Christ to the world. That what we say and what we do represents Christ and God to the world. Right? Yesterday, James Risch got his Eagle Scout, and that's part of the Eagle Ceremonies, to say, you now represent the highest ideals of scouting to the world. What you do is what people will think scouts are. What we do and what we say is how people will think Christians are. So the writer of Ephesians says, be imitators of Christ. Which means we don't just get to do whatever we want to do or say. Because what we do represents God. And so it should represent the love and grace and forgiveness of God. 
And we do that because of what God has already done for us. Like Christ, we seek not to do our own will, but the will of God. By turning to the light, not seeking the things of this world, but by being the light to the world. And so we've talked a lot about baptism, what happens in the water of baptism, including a few moments ago. But I actually learned something from the early church practices of baptism that I didn't know. I learned that this week. And that is, as part of the baptismal um, liturgy, they would begin facing the West as they said that they were going to reject the things of this world. And then they would turn to the East and say that they were going to follow Christ, representing the light of Christ, overcoming the darkness with the sun rising in the morning in the east, turning away from the darkness of the west to turn to the light of Christ before they entered into the waters of baptism, to symbolically represent that movement from the ways of the world to the ways of Christ. To live in the light. And to imitate Christ. To be Christ's love to the world. Because what we say and what we do matter. And so Jesus says, do not complain. She'll tell you she's almost five. <clears throat> Don't complain. Because when we complain, we miss our blessings. Instead, appreciate what God has given to us Love and grace and forgiveness to build us up so that we can go forward to give that to the world. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. And I invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Remain seated if that's more comfortable for our hymn of response. Because if there is to be peace on earth, it must begin with us. Walk with each other in power.
be seated. Before we lift up our celebrations and concerns to God this morning, we'd like to lift up some of the work of the church. For those in the sanctuary, you'll find an insert in your worship guide, which has a list of announcements, things that are happening, a couple we'd like to highlight. First is that our um, next Midsummer Night Fellowship activity is this afternoon at 5 o'clock at Barranca Mesa Pool. You do not need to be a member of the pool in order to attend. Uh, we've paid for your attendance. Um, even though it's sunny right now, there is still a chance, much less than it was yesterday, for thunderstorms this afternoon. Um, and so if there's thunder and lightning, we can't be there. If it's just raining, we can be there. So uh, if you hear thunder or lightning around 4 o'clock, we'll have to cancel and we'll send out an email to everybody. So if you are planning on attending, please let us know, either by si signing up uh, at the sheet at the back of the sanctuary for those in the, uh, in the sanctuary. For, if you're worshiping online, send me an email at pastor at lafumc.org so we can make sure to notify you if we are indeed um, canceling that. And then next Sunday, uh, we're going to be leading a gentle hike. Tom Ricketts will be leading that. And that will be at 2.30, and you'll find more information uh, in the scripture. Uh, uh, sorry, in the um, bulletin insert as well as in the newsletter. For, <coughs> excuse me. at the end of the week, again, in preparation for worship, so apologize for that. Uh, for the past few weeks, we've been thanking uh, the people who help us in leading worship uh, for our choir members and members of our, our praise team, uh, and we've lifted up Yelena's name, but she has not been here, so Yelena, thank you for uh, playing for us. And then this morning, we're going to give thanks... We're going to give thanks to all the volunteers who help in the other ways, in the uh, greeting, uh, ushering, coffee, sound booth, lay readers, um, all those people. And so I'm going to ask uh, Philip and Valerie if you will uh, assist in giving out. And so there are, um, as your name is read, you're invited to come forward and get your gift. And there's actually two of them. So if you're in the same household, make sure you get different ones. One is time and one is sunflowers. Um, so you can grab those and grab the ones you like. So as I call your name, uh, please come forward. Uh, James Bearfield, Christine Benkoski, Don Casperson, Linda Collier, Janice Courtwright, Jeannie Gibson, Dennis Gill, Opal Lee Gill, Peggy Goldman, Kim Granzo, Jolene Hatler, Lauren Hatler, Kathy Hinojosa, Tito Hinojosa, Nels Hoffman, Lynn Klugel, Anne LePage, Dylan Johnston, Abigail Nash, Linda Nash, Samantha Nash, Philip Ortega, Tom Ricketts, Vicki Ricketts, Bob Risch, James Risch, Julie Risch, Peggy Roby, Mariana Schoberg, Don Seabee, Kathy Seabee, Lee Wineland, Camille Westcott, Sam Westcott, and Harriet Zickerts. And we do our best to make sure that we capture everyone, but if you have volunteered in worship in the last year and we did not name you, please come forward as well and make sure you get your name added to the list. I think we caught everybody. Um, but please let us give thanks to all of them for their work in making worship possible. <clears throat> Worship guide, you will find an insert for worship volunteers, which will be for the next six months. So if you sign up, this is not a lifetime commitment, right? We do them in six months uh, batches. And so if you are currently volunteering for something, there's a space on there where you can say, I'd like to unvolunteer for that. I don't want to be doing that anymore. 
or if you'd like to add things. In particular, we're going to be in need. Um, two of our AV volunteers will be going away to college in the fall, um, so we need some new AV volunteers. We will train you on that. We'll train you on being a lay reader, on being an usher, uh, on setting up coffee, whatever it is you like to volunteer. If it's new for you, we will train you and tell you how to do that job. So um, these will be in for the next few weeks um, uh, in the, the, wor- the worship guide. And so you can, if you'd like to fill them out now, place them into the uh, offering plates as we pass those around just a few moments uh, for worship. So one of our expectations is that we'll be in prayer at least once a day. And so in your worship guide, you'll find a list of celebrations and concerns we are aware of earlier this week. And part of our membership vows is that we will support one another in prayer. And so in the scripture insert, you'll find a list of the families of the church to be in prayer for this week and a few more to add to your list. Again, as we already lifted up, uh, celebrations for James Rich, James Rich receiving his Eagle Scout yesterday. And uh, thank you to all who came out to celebrate Uh, with him. Prayers of celebration for the rain and also ask that it will continue. And then prayers for the train crash in India with the death toll nearing 300. So as we go to God on this Trinity Sunday, we'll lift up our petition. I will say God in three persons and we respond, hear our prayers. We give you thanks, O God, for our world, which you made and renewed in the power of Jesus's resurrection. Make us wise and careful of your gifts as we live on earth. God in three persons, hear our prayers. We pray that the love which passes ceaselessly between the Father and the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit may renew and deepen the life of each Christian, each Christian and draw us, draw us all into your unending life. God in three persons. Hear our prayers. We pray for the leaders of the church, for Protestants, for Roman Catholics and the Orthodox, for Sunday school children and youth, for the elderly whose wise counsel is sorely needed in all ages, and for all ecumenical endeavors that seek to bring us closer to each other and to you. God in three persons, hear our prayers. We pray for the earth and all creatures and plants, for healthy water and air and soil, for policies and laws that regard our home and God's universe as a precious gift. God in three persons, hear our prayers. families, our households, and our communities, that your life together as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit may show us with like importance of each each of us and strengthen us in your grace and truth. God, in three persons, hear our prayers. Those who suffer in any way, for those who struggle to pay rent or a mortgage, for those who have no home, for those who are neglected and abused in our communities, for people who long for family and are instead alone, for children who do not have a good guide to raise them up, and for whatever else you see that we need, God in three persons, hear our prayers. We pray for all those that we have named before you, and for those who are known only on our hearts. God, in three persons, hear our prayer. Into your hands we entrust all that is of concern this day. Sure that you hear our pleas, grateful that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
one God now and forever. Amen. So as we've lifted up the names of people who help us in worship, I think it's probably at least 50 people, um, considering we average a little over 100 in worship. About half of you are uh, participating in worship in uh, leadership form here. All of us participate in leadership just by being here. Um, And so your gifts also make that possible. So one of our membership vows is that we will support this church through our ties and offerings. So we recommend giving up a portion of our income with a tithe or 10% as the goal. And so there's several ways that you can give. For those in the sanctuary, or pass, pass around the plates in a few moments. If you give in electronically, you'll find your green card in the pew pocket. You can place that into the plate representing your gift. If you'd like to give electronically, you can go to our website, firstinyourheart.org, or the Church Center app. Click on Secure Giving and follow those steps. You can also text the dollar amount you'd like to give to 84321 and follow those steps or simply mail in your checks to the church. Uh, Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making a difference. We are indeed God's love in action. If the ushers would please come forward to receive this morning's offering.
We continue with our prayers of celebration by gathering at Christ's table, and so I invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable. Again, be seated if that is more comfortable. Friends, this is the joyful feast for the people of God. By the mysterious wonder of our triune God, we gather here to celebrate a feast for all time, joining with Jesus and his disciples in an upper room with the church of all ages who have come here so often, and with sisters and brothers in faith all along the way and around the world with people we know well and don't know at all. Here we trust that the mystery of God will become real. Here we can't gain a taste of the divine. And here we are fed as we go forth to serve the world. Come, all of you, and share this feast of holiness and wonder of God as we confess together. Merciful Praise God. God. There we go. Merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we have, have not loved you with, with our whole hearts. hearts. We We have have failed failed to be an obedient church. We We have not done your will. We We have have broken your law. law. We have have rebelled rebelled against your love. And we have have not loved our neighbors. And we have have not heard heard the cry of the needy. Forgive Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name name of Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, you are are forgiven. forgiven. Glory Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And And also also with you. Lift up your hearts to the Lord. We lift lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And as we give thanks, I invite you as you are called to extend your hands in front of you as a sign of giving. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the face of the waters. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, Your love remains steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As we give, we also receive, and so I invite you to pull your hands into your chest as a sign of receiving. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and declared him your beloved son. With your spirit upon him, he turned away the temptations of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire, as on the day of Pentecost. In the night in which he gave himself up for us, as he gathered with the disciples in the upper room, he took a piece of bread, and he gave thanks to you, and he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you remember in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took a cup, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. 
And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. And one of the oldest ways of being in prayer was not to clasp your hands and bow your head, but instead to lift your arms and face to God. So I invite you to do that as we call for God to pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquets. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you, as you are comfortable, to continue to reach out your hands to others as a sign of blessing, as together with the confidence of children of God, we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for all we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. You may be seated. And if the servers would please come forward. blood of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ given for you Joan and the blood of Christ given for you Lord. practice an open communion table because this table is not owned by us, it is owned by Christ. So if you have any concerns of whether you're welcome, put them aside for all are welcome at Christ's table. You're invited to come down the center aisle, cup your hands, and we'll piece of, place a piece of the bread into your hand. The bread is gluten, nut, dairy, egg, and soy free. Uh, and then dip it into the grape juice, uh, receiving both elements at the same time. Then you can be in prayer at the kneeling rail and return to your seats by the side aisle. Come, for all things are ready. Come, taste and see that God is good.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit, united in the body of Christ to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable for our closing hymn. We haven't sung this in a little while, but we encourage those in the sanctuary to form a circle around the sanctuary and hold hands as we remember to draw the circle wide. expectations and we'll be reading the Bible daily so in your scripture insert you'll find recommended scripture readings for each day of the week you'll find a prayer uh, for the the week to help you do your daily prayer and scripture reading questions to help you prepare for next Sunday which is a contemporary worship service we move on to the to the do not of do not store up treasures uh, here on earth so we invite you to make use of this during the week uh, take it home with you and make use of it during the week Hear are these words from Paul's letters to the Romans I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So filled with the words of grace and love, go forth to be God's grace and love to the world. And may the love of the Father and the strength of the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Now go, be the church.